¡Vamos! Hello, everyone. Is my mic working, working now? now? Yes, we are. The mic is now that working. Fantastic. Sorry, Sorry about, about that. that. Good, good morning. morning. Good, good afternoon. afternoon. Good evening. Wherever, Wherever you're joining, joining us from the world today. today. And, and this, this is Get Up's Virtual Meetup for, for Africa. Africa. My, my name, name is Omoju Miller. I'm the technical, technical advisor to the CEO here, here at Get Up. And beyond that, I'm a Nigerian American. Grew up in Lagos, Nigeria, and currently living in the Bay Area. With, With that, that, I'm, I'm going to give a few, few remarks, remarks and I'll, I'll be sharing, sharing my screen, screen to, get to get this to you all. So, so GitHub is, let me, let me move forward. Uh, we, we are very committed, committed to the Africa region. region. We're, We're going to be hosting, hosting monthly virtual, virtual meetups until we can meet in person. We have our community farms and we have our program at GitHub Stars. Stars. Beyond, Beyond that, that, we have, we have been, been going, going back and visiting the continent for several years now by building, building a soft, soft relationship with people there. And, and with this new year, we're going to be going deeper in those relationships. relationships. And we're, we're very, very proud, proud to say that, that a few of our GitHub stars are from the African region. So, so today, today I'm, I'm going to be giving, giving you a welcome address, address and you're going to hear, hear about community-driven security from Xavier Ray Carl, who's also at GitHub. And, and then you're going to have a 20-minute of quick releases with GitHub packages with Prosper or Temple 15, 15 minutes, you're going to have tools, tips, tips and strategies for open source developers using VS Code and Code Spaces from Lawrence Tonga. After, After Lawrence, Lawrence, you're going, going to hear from Samson Gotti, who's, who's going, going to be talking, talking to you about why you should care about, about open source. source. When, when Samson, Samson finishes, he's, he's going to hand out to Corpus, who's going to be talking to you today about GitHub Actions, actions and using Terraform, Terraform to provision infrastructure. infrastructure. I, will I will come back with that closing, closing remarks, remarks, and then we can do what we always do at meetups, have a breakout room, but this time it's going to be virtually. Over the last... 
12 months, we have shipped 200 features at GitHub. We've shipped uh, features for community and collaboration. We've shipped features for enterprise and source security and code cloud automation. They're over 200 features, so I can't actually speak to all of them right now. But one of the most interesting things you can do is go to our public roadmap so, so you can, can see, see what, what we have even coming, coming down, down the line. line. So, so we, we have, have like public roadmap is github.com forward slash github forward slash roadmaps, roadmaps and they can get the project there. there. And, and you can, can see, see all the things that we have on the pipeline, pipeline from, from July 2020 through March 2021. We've been investing, investing in fundamentals. We are, we are focusing now on social coding. GitHub is a social computing platform. We are very interested in building that network so that it's richer. And we're investing in code to cloud. And most importantly, we're investing in improving our reliability. For community and collaboration, we have something that I'm very excited about, the README project. And this README project is when you, you get, get to meet, meet the people, people behind the code, code people, people behind open source, source people, people who have been dedicated, dedicated their, their time to serve our community. It's, it's the maintainers, it's developers, it's the, developers, it's the team members whose contributions move the ball forward every, every single day. day. And, and this is uh, a version, version of, of the story that you're looking at is the story of Gift Ewenu, who has been building open source from Lagos, Nigeria. So make sure you take some time and worry about it. We, we have, have built, built and shipped, shipped in May get up discussions. discussions. We, we believe that, that every open source project should have a landing delay, should, should have, have like a community square. square. And, and that, that is what get up discussions are. A place to have open-ended conversations, to ask a question and get an answer, to brainstorm about something, a place to get recognition for the work that they do. And that, that may not just be coded. It may be a place just to say, thank you so much for creating this project. It could be a place to say, I'm hosting an event. Some people may say, why, why do I have all this conversation and get up issues? But get up issues is fundamentally a productivity tool that you use to prioritize and plan your work. So imagine if thousands of people had right access to your own personal to-do list and used it to have open-ended conversations about all the things they think that maybe you should do. Some of the ideas are probably great, so you wanna encourage the conversation, but maybe you wanna move it to another place so that these open discussions are not intermingled with your priorities. Every community needs a town square. And we've built one with GitHub discussion. So check it out. Code spaces. We are taking a new approach, even a newer approach to lowering the barrier to becoming a developer on any project by introducing code spaces. Code spaces gives you a world class editor running in the browser, backed by a containerized developer environment hosted in the cloud. Instead of spending precious time setting up your dev environment, you can get started with just one click. And best of all, Code Spaces is powered by VS Code and supports every VS Code extension out of the box. You have to see it to believe it. The people who have been using it have been so excited about it that you can just go to the hashtag Code Spaces on Twitter and find all the interesting ways that people have been using Code Spaces. In addition to that, we have GitHub for mobile. And this is a very interesting, we've not had a native app before, now we do. And the best part about this is I saw someone tweet a quote, they were on a rowboat just chilling out in the lake and they were merging pull requests because they had GitHub mobile. So you can take GitHub with you anywhere. We launched our native apps for iOS and Android. These are beautiful, buttery smooth apps. And one interesting thing that we've learned is that the most common use case for the app is to review and approve pull requests, like I said. Whether you're out and about or just in your backyard, everyone wants a way to un unblock their colleagues. And with GitHub for mobile, you can do that. So we also have our, our pillar of code to cloud, getting your code to the cloud. We have GitHub Actions. And we have GitHub packages. So GitHub Actions is our powerful, flexible CI CD. It's our orchestration tool that lets you build, test, and deploy faster to any cloud. 
at secure and scalable workflow automation and then packages with packages, people can just go and pull your packages straight from the GitHub package repository. We will not be, GitHub suite of products would not be complete without security, securing the open source. Majority of us are not security experts, but with CodeQL, the world most advanced semantic code engine. It allows us to turn the source code into a relational data that can be queried for vulnerabilities. And these queries can be quickly customized to adapt to any specific threat topology. But best of all, it is community powered. It is powered by security researchers who are putting all their information out there. And that information now is available to serve you. And the thing we've done is we put this as part of your own workflow as well. With GitHub Actions and our Dependabot tool, you can make security as part of your developer workflow so you don't have to worry about it. So every time you push and you run your project, security runs on top of it, making sure that your system is safe. So those are the things we've been doing at GitHub for the last 12 months. And with that, I am going to hand off to the next speaker on our, and I think our speaker, the next speaker is going to be Xavier from GitHub. So Xavier, you have the floor. Hey, thank you, Madhu. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm, I'm going to share my screen right now. OK. and you should be seeing my screen now. Hey, okay, everyone. Uh, hello, so I'm Xavier Um uh, I will tell you about community-driven security. So let me first introduce my team. I am leading the GitHub Security Lab. Uh, there are a bunch of hackers who get crazy about popping up funny message on your computer or crashing the office printer or restarting all the iPhones connected to the Wi-Fi. Um, and what we want to do at the GitHub Security Lab is to use this talent to help secure open source software. 95% uh, of software in production is using open source software. And a security flow in one project can lead to catastrophic breaches, like the Equifax one in 2017. A bug in Apache Struts led to the breach of the financial information of 145 million accounts. To secure open source, our approach is not to magically transform every developer into a security expert. Our approach is to make security easy for developers. We believe that the only way to achieve this is with a community effort, and this is the subject of this uh, presentation. What I will do is that I will show you a concrete real-life case where the community helped eradicate a security vulnerability. So let's begin with uh, describing this vulnerability. It's called the zip slip vulnerability, and it was disclosed two years ago by uh, the security company Snick. So this is uh, C sharp, and this C sharp code extracts an archive, um, a zip, into a given directory. We get the file name uh, from the archive with path.get file name, and then we just concatenate this name with the destination directory by calling path.combine. Path.combine is a simple, plain string concatenation. So if a malicious hacker can forge an archive containing entries with dot dot slash something and dot dot slash dot dot slash something and dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash something, all these files will get extracted outside the destination directory in a place where they're not supposed to be. And they could give elevated privileges to the attacker on your file system. This vulnerability is called uh, class, um, the class is called a path traverser. Now let's see how it was fixed. Uh, this is a quite critical vulnerability. It, it, it was spread across many open source projects and the security company Snick led a campaign to fix a lot of them two years ago. The fix is super simple. You resolve the full paths of both the destination file and the destination directory. And then you just check that the file's full path starts with the directory's full path. And if not, you throw an error. OK, so it's a critical vulnerability, but uh, an easy fix. But the fixing process itself has a lot of limitations. The effort needed to find this bug's pattern is repeated and uh, also adapted to each library. 
the sneak campaigns lasted seven months, three, four months. And one fixed, how can you make sure that the bug won't come back in your project when a new contributor proposes a PR? Do you trust your code review process? So to fix these limitations, we fortunately have a magic weapon. Well, uh, I'm a developer, so I know that there is no such thing as magic. And the only weapon I use is code. So let me introduce you to CodeQL. CodeQL is a tool developed by GitHub, free for open source. And CodeQL extracts all the hierarchical nature of your code into a relational DB. Then with an optimized language, you will run a query similar to a SQL on your code. And with those queries, you can find security bugs. Well, in fact, you can find all bugs, in fact. Um, I will try to give you a quick demo of CodeQL. So let me jump to Visual Studio Code. So here I'm in Visual Studio Code and uh, I have installed the free CodeQL extension for Visual Studio Code that you can find on the marketplace. With the CodeQL tool, uh, I um, created a database from the Bootstrap JS code base. And now I'm ready to query it. So I will first start to import the CodeQL library that are uh, that are needed to, um, uh, to query JavaScript and TypeScript code. And then all CodeQL queries are under the form from where select. Let's say that I want to select all the uh, method calls that are in the bootstrap JS code base. So I will start with from. And then I have here auto completion that is quite handy and documentation, if I look at that. Okay, so method call is a method call expression. So this is exactly what I want. Let me query all of them. Okay, so I run code QL run query. Okay, let me rerun it again. Okay, here I've got the results appearing on the right, and if I click on them, it will jump to the uh, to a read-only version of the Bootstrap code. So here, this is uh, um, a method call. This is really a method call. Yeah, I got here all my method calls. Okay, now let's add a filter where call dot, and here I get uh, with auto completion a list of all the attributes that I can uh, use to, uh, to, 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 to filter my objects. Uh, these, are, these are called predicates. So for example, let's use this one, get curly name. Get curly name gets me the name of the function or the method being invoked. These predicates can return either a Boolean or an object. This one returns a string. What's funny is that I can chain them. So for example, after this curly name, I can chain it with uh, a regex match, for example. I can chain the predicates like that. Okay, let's use this predicate. And let's say that I want to, um, to detect all the method calls that are reading a file in my file system. I can do that with um, uh, this curly name should be in red file sync or uh, red JSON, for example. Okay, let's run this query. Okay, and here we go. So I've got here eight results that are the calls to red file sync and the calls to red JSON. Okay. Now, let's say that I'm not interested in the calls themselves, but I'm interested in um, all the files that are being read. I will declare another, another variable file, and I will bind them to my call. So here I can, I know that these functions are reading the file that is passed as first argument. So I will say that my file is the first argument of of this call. And then I will display 
let me display the coding name and the file. Okay, I run this query. And here we go. I've got here uh, the results pane, the name on the functions, and I can click on the file result to get to, uh, to the file that is read. Okay, let's have a look at this query. You can see that is it's very, very similar to a SQL, right? You declare your tables, uh, you declare your joints, uh, you declare your filter, uh, and then you save it. But CodeQL is a language that can abstract a lot of the SQL for you. So for example, I will simplify that. I will remove the declaration here. I will remove the join here. And I will use directly uh, the get argument predicate here, get argument zero. And when I launch this query, you will see that you will get exactly the same results. Nothing changes here. But CodeQL has done uh, the, the, all the SQL behind the scenes. So the declaration, the join, etc. Okay, now let's do something a bit more complicated. These two functions are reading the file that is passed as first argument. But if, um, what if I, I got another function that reads the file that is passed as second argument? For example, I have a dummy read, uh, let me fix that, dummy read second argument. In this case, this call won't give me what I expect. So CodeQL is an object-oriented language. So I can create my own class and extend this method called expert. This is what I will do here. So let's say that I create a class that I call my file read and that uh, extends method called, oh, sorry, method called exp, oops, okay. Here I will define the characteristic of my new class. And to do that, what I will do is that I will just copy this filter here. So this is it. So here I just defined that my file read is a, a new class that extends method called exp, but that only uh, get these objects where the uh, method invoked is read file sync, read JSON, or this dummy read second argument methods. Okay. So now I will use this new class here instead of method called exp, and I can remove this filter because this filter is already in my class definition. And now I can create new methods or override existing methods for my new class. So I will create a new method called get file argument that returns an expression. And I will say that um, basically what I want to do is to say that if uh, the function reads the first file, then my result will be uh, the first argument. If the function reads the second file, then my result will be the second argument. So I can copy that here and say, okay, if my function is read file sync or read JSON, then my result is the first argument of the call. But if uh, my function is this uh, dummy read second argument function. Then in this case, my result is the second argument. Okay, and then instead of calling here get argument zero, I will call my newly created uh, predicate which is already available in the auto completion. And when I launch this query, you will see that I get exactly the same results, but I also get a much more expressive uh, query because here I can really 
read and see that, okay, this is a class that creates a file and I'm looking for the name of the function and the uh, file argument. So instead of reading argument of zero, I get file argument, which is much more clear and much more uh, expressive. Okay, I'm going to let the query run. So just that you see that it's actually getting the same results. And here we go, exactly the same results. Okay, let me go back to the slides. So, uh, so this was a short demo of CodeQL, but what I want you to take away uh, from this demo, and that will be useful for the rest of the presentation, it's first, it's ready to go. You take the query, you run it on your code, and you get the result. Two, it's extensible. It adapts to different code patterns that you have seen with my uh, get argument zero, get argument one. Third, it's, pre it's expressive. You read it, and you can understand what it does. So back to our zip slip case, a security researcher at Microsoft named Dennis Levin coded a code QL query to find all occurrences of the zip slip vulnerability in Microsoft C Sharp code. The query uses code QL's data flow library and its stain tracking feature, which taints all data flowing from a given source to a given sink. Let me dive a bit into this. So code QL contains data flowing from between two places of your code base through different functions, through different files. So if you can define that a place is an untrusted data source, so in our case, it would be the file name of an entry of an archive. And if you can define that another place is a sink where this untrusted data might end up and cause harm, and in, the world, in our case, this is writing into the file system, then CodeQL will do the rest of the work for you and identify all the paths in your code base between these two places. So here is how Dennis defines the source. It's a property access. And if it accesses the property called full name of an object typed zip archive entry, then this is a source for our zip tip case. And here it defines the sinks. If you have a call to methods system IO file open, open write, or create, then the path argument of this method call is a sync. And with that query, Dennis was able to find all the paths where the full name coming from an archive entry was used as a path argument of a file wipe. So he found all the occurrences of zip slip into his code. So let's step back a bit and you remember the limitations we talked about uh, when fixing these kind of problems, how to adapt to different code bases, how to avoid repetitive process, and how to make sure the bug doesn't come back. With the extensible code QL, we can adapt to different code patterns. Second, the query is ready to launch on several code bases, so you don't have any more the repetitive process. And three, because it's executable, you can run it within your CI. GitHub code scanning that you can see here on, on the slide in beta uses to, it to detect bugs during the pull request before it gets into your main branch. So the problem won't come back. And that's already good. This is an example of what we want to achieve at the security lab. At the security lab. We take the knowledge of one security researcher and we make it directly usable by all developers. OK, so we saw what the tool can do, but now let's see what the community can do. The code QL queries are open source on GitHub. Everyone can contribute. And as CodeQL is free for open source, everyone can use the queries. So Dennis Levin didn't only fix his code and his company's code. He opened the PR on the open source repo, making his query available for all open source C-sharp projects who wanted to include it in, into their workflow. Because it's open source, security researchers and developers can collaborate on the queries and make them relevant for more patterns. Since the first contribution from Dennis Levin for C-sharp, Similar queries have been created by the community for Java, JavaScript, Go, Python. And note that these new queries were written by developers and not security researchers. Here, you can see an example of a contribution from the community to improve the Go data flow library. They identified that the library could not recognize data flow through some functions of the Go standard library. And they made a PR to fix that. This improvement of the data flow library did not only improve the zip slip and go query, but all queries using data flow. So what's interesting in this example is that the knowledge of security researchers who know how code can be vulnerable 
and the knowledge of the developers who are experts in the language itself can be mixed and complete each other. So it's not any more security expert telling developers what to do. It's both working together. So uh, I'm wrapping up here why community, why I think community-driven security is a game changer. First, with open source queries, the knowledge from one security researcher is shared with all open source projects. And it's not shared in a book, right? It's shared under the form of an executable query that you can use on your code. This is really actionable knowledge. Two, we get contributions from the best security research team. Three, this is an opportunity to bridge the I'm sorry. I... So that's it. Thank you for listening to me. Obviously, our goal is to build a community of everyone interested in securing open source. So if you want to get resources on how to secure your projects, if you want to contribute to globally secure open source, join us. On that page, you will find interactive courses to learn CodeQL, research articles, and also a bounty program. You can contribute to the community queries and get paid at the same time. See you soon. Okay. Um, handing over to you, Omoju. Yes. So the next person we're going to be hearing from is Prosper. Prosper, are you ready? Uh, yes, I'm ready. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So, handing over to you, Prosper. All right. Um, okay, so I'm just going to share my screen right now. Uh, give me a second. All right. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, so my topic for today is quick releases with GitHub packages. And uh, I'm just going to introduce myself a bit. Uh, my name is Prosper Otemu uh, I currently work as the lead engineer at Eden, uh, also double as CTO. It is a small startup in Lagos that is, um, you know, very focused on improving the quality of life for Nigerians and for Africans in general. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. You can also find me on GitHub as Unicode developer. And uh, I'm also here with my friend, my open source buddy. Uh, I mean, he's an Octocat, so he's here with me too. So say hi to my favorite open source buddy right now. Okay, uh, so let's get to the meat of the event. Uh, I like to call myself an open source fanboy. Uh, I've been contributing to open source since 2015. Uh, so that's like five years, um, mostly very um, very rooted in the PHP and the Laravel community. And then I like to provide resources for, you know, many people that are learning to code. So if you check my repository on GitHub at Unicode Developer, you can find a lot of repositories that, you know, you might find helpful. And which is what, which is one of the things that actually led me to this talk. Uh, I love open source so much and I love like building packages. And then when GitHub packages came out, I tried it out and it was just like really, really straightforward. And I'm just going to share some of those experiences with you on this call. So what are GitHub packages? Um, very simple. So when you think about a package, you think about some of many of you, in fact, as a developer, I, I've really not seen any developer that has actually not used, you know, a package in whatever software they've built before. We all depend on packages written by individuals and written by, by companies. Um, no matter how big the application is, you just have very few apps or very few packages that are not dependent on other packages. So GitHub packages is literally, 
you think about a hosting service, a software hosting service that allows you to just host your software. You know, the same way you use GitHub right now, but take whatever code you have, package it, and just give it to other people to use. So the same way you can publish, uh, before now, the same way you could publish your, you know, NPM packages, or if you have a core PHP developer, you publish on packages with Composer, or you publish with Marvin for folks that are very, um, very, you know, focused on working with Java. And then for .NET folks too, you can use the NuGet package manager. So GitHub packages is just a service that allows you to just, you know, publish your, your code straight to GitHub and let other people consume them. So what do you, what do you gain with releasing code with GitHub packages, essentially? Um, so number one, integration with your, your favorite package tools registry. So it works with NPM, Ruby Gems, if you already have an account, Marvin, .NET. And the reason why I said almost is because this does not work with PHP yet. Uh, I love PHP so much. I've read PHP for a very long time, but for some reasons, we don't have PHP integration yet, but I'm, I'm sure that's probably coming. And then you have this sweet spot integration with GitHub Actions. So if you have used GitHub Actions in the audience, you, you kind of have an idea of what I'm talking about. GitHub Actions is literally the best thing since sliced bread, to be honest, because there are so many things that you can automate with GitHub Actions. You can even, you know, you can automate publishing on GitHub packages with GitHub Actions. You can, you know, set up a whole complete CI CD pipeline with GitHub Actions. And then even the code within your GitHub packages, you can have some form of integration that allows people that allows your code to connect with GitHub Actions, right? And then now GitHub just, you know, recently released what you call the GitHub Container Registry. So for many of you that are very, you know, uh, enthusiastic about containers, you use Docker, you use Kubernetes, you can also now, you know, publish your Docker images on GitHub with GitHub packages. And um, finally, no PHP yet. I'm going to say that again. <laughs> uh, hopefully that comes soon. All right. Let's talk about how to work with GitHub packages, basically. So if you already work with NPM, or you are a Ruby developer, or you work with Java.net, you already have tools that you use in each of these communities. You know, you have NPM, you have the Ruby gem, you have Marvin, you have Nougat, right? And um, GitHub packages is just saying, hey, you have these existing tools. So why, instead of, you know, coming up with an entirely new different tool for you to work with, you can use some of these existing tools to publish your code to GitHub, you know, straight to GitHub. So GitHub hosts the code instead of having it in another registry on, you know, different platforms. So before now, when I develop my PHP packages, you know, I push the code to GitHub. When I push the code to GitHub, I have to create an account on packages. And then I have to make sure there's an integration. There's somewhere in, you know, my composer, the JSON file, I put an integration to ensure that, you know, this is published to, um, to packages. So the code exists on GitHub, and then we have a copy. And I think the copy is, you know, is usually updated once I push to GitHub to ensure that there's another copy on packages. But if GitHub packages was to have an integration for PHP, I wouldn't have to do that anymore. Everything would just be, my workflow would just be streamlined to GitHub alone, which makes it easier and also faster for me to you know, develop packages. So just look at the quick steps in publishing a package. This talk is literally a very short talk just to tell you how, how like very fast you can publish your packages with GitHub. So if you have not done that before, just follow me. And by the end of this talk, you have everything that it takes to publish a package. So I'm going to use um, NPM as an example. But before we get that, let's look at the process for publishing a GitHub package. It's very simple. You have three major processes involved. You get your access token, you authenticate with GitHub, and then you configure your package clients. It's very simple. Um, as a developer, you already you know, know what an access token is, right? An access token, you can use that for so many things. You create an access token as a way of authenticating with an external service or a third party service, and then you can you know, attach scopes so that when the other party gets the token, it can just assign uh, roles and responsibilities for what you need to do on that platform. Same thing too with GitHub. You create an access token, you, you know, log in to GitHub packages with the access token, and then you just configure your package client. And I'm going to go through each of these step by step to tell you how simple this is to integrate. So number one, you get the access token. How do you do that? Simple, head over to github.com slash settings slash token slash new. And uh, the reason why I provided this link is so you don't have to you know, go through uh, several UI dropdowns. Because if you want to go from github.com 
you, you have to be logged into GitHub on the right. You click on settings. From settings, you go to um, um, developer settings, I think. Then from developer settings, you go to um, personal access tokens. But if you click on this link, settings slash tokens slash new, you go straight to the page. Select the appropriate scope. So for you to be able to work, for you to be able to write, update, and delete your packages, you need to check these scopes. Write packages, read packages, delete packages, and then the repo has to be in check too. So everything, most everything about your repo, the repo status, um, invite to the repo deployment, and all of, all of that good stuff needs to, you know, those scopes need to be activated for you to be able to publish your package and you know manage it effectively. So once you have selected the appropriate scopes, give the access token a name. Now you are giving the access token a name so that you can you know, easily identify it on your, your GitHub dashboard. You create the access token. So once it, gener it generates it, you have to copy the access token to a very secure space. So once you copy that, we go to the next stage, authentication with GitHub. Very simple and straightforward. So <clears throat> the first question is, what's the package client of your choice? Uh, do you want to use NPM? Are you using Maven? Are you using um, .NET? In this case, I, I went with the option that a lot of people can relate to it. Uh, I'm sure a lot of us have used uh, Node.js at some point in time, um, not even about publishing packages right now, but you know, just working with Node.js. So many of you will have NPM installed on your machines. So if you go with NPM, it's simple. Uh, if you have installed Node, you already have NPM. So all you need to do is log in via NPM. And this is the URL, basically, very straightforward. NPM login, you specify the registry. Now, GitHub packages have these URLs for the different <coughs> package clients. So for NPM, it is called npm.pkg.github.com. Um, for, for Maven, it is maven.pkg.github.com. For RubyGems, I think it is um, rubygems.com pkg.github.com. So for, for, for Node, in this instance, you log in, like you can see on the screen, on the screenshot, you have npm login hyphen iPhone registry equal to <coughs> the registry, npm.pkg.github.com. Uh, I put in my username, which is my GitHub username. Now, the password I put in was the access token I generated in the previous slide. So I just paste the access token and put it as a password. I click enter, I put in my email, and then voila, I log in as Unicode developer. Now, once you're done logging in, it's time for you to com uh, configure your package clients. Now, at this point, I assume you have written the code that you need to publish to GitHub, right? So what do you need to configure to enable this thing to allow you publish to, pack, um, to GitHub easily? Uh, I talked about these different clients. Uh, I'm just putting this here so you can see them, the rubygems.net, but we'll just move forward. For NPM, let's publish. So this is how you go about it. Number one, you already have the code within your 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 directory. Um, whether you're accessing it from your timeline or whatever, you already have that, right? Now you have the package JSON. For every developer on this call that has developed, you know, worked with Node.js, you know what a package JSON file is. Now for the PHP developers. You know, your composer.json file is literally like your package.json file. Everything that you need to do, everything that you need to specify about the packages that you are depending upon. Also, you know, the name of the app. In this case, your package.json is going to have some new properties that you are probably not aware of right now. So the number one most important part of your package.json file is the publish config, config sorry, the publish config property. Now that property is going to have this value called registry. The registry is going to point to npm.pkg.github.com slash your GitHub username, right? This is going to be your account for where your packages are stored. Um, in some cases, you can just have this published config and you're good to go. But I, I, I've, you know, I've tried this a couple of times and I discovered that to be sure that everything goes as planned, I include a repository key. Now the repository key just literally links to the GitHub repo, the GitHub repo for that particular package. And then at the name to the name of your package or JSON file needs to be your username slash the repo name. So in this case, I named the package GitHub Africa. 
And then my username on GitHub is Unicode Developer. So at Unicode Developer slash GitHub Africa, for the repository, I link it to GitHub Africa, which is the repo on my account. If you go to my GitHub profile now, you are going to see this repository. And then in the publish config, which is the most important part of publishing to GitHub, I now have um, this slash, my username. And that is all you literally need to publish to GitHub. So you run npm publish on your command line. And once you're done with that, this is what you get, right? So from the, from the command line, you can see, I hope this image is clear enough, but from the command line, when you run npm publish, um, you can see it's packaging your repository, uh, specifying the name, what are all the files it needs, and then boom, it tags the version 1.0.0. And that's basically, that's literally all you need to do to publish to GitHub. So if you go to GitHub, if you go to your account, um, right now, for every account, you see overview repositories, projects, and packages. But for many of you that might not have published a package before now, right now your packages will be zero, like you don't have anything right there. But when you publish a package, it shows up the same way your repositories show up under the repositories channel, uh, part of the UI, and your projects show up under the projects. You're going to see your packages now under the packages section of your profile. And anybody that comes to your profile too can see all the packages that you, know, that you have released. So on the repository side of things, they can see the code base. On the packages side, they can see the published version of your package. This is literally all it takes to publish to GitHub package. Like it is so straightforward and so simple. I'm just going to recap the process again. Number one, you generate an access token. Number two, you want to with GitHub. Number three, you configure and publish. And this is all it takes for you to have quick releases with GitHub. And that's all for my talk. So you can follow me again on Twitter at Unicode Developer for more questions. You can also um, follow me on GitHub, uh, Unicode Developer. And if you have any questions, feel free to DM me, feel, uh, feel free to shoot me an email. And um, that's all for now. And my open source Octopcat to is saying thank you. Thank you for coming to this call. Thank you, Prosper. And we're gonna be hearing next from Lawrence Mutonga. Lawrence, you ready? Yes, I am. All right. It's up to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon from wherever you're joining. Um, we're glad to have you. Uh, my name is Lawrence Modoga. I look after the developer ecosystem for Microsoft across Africa. And uh, I would say the last few months have been very interesting, right? We've had uh, the virus come up, we've gone into lockdown. And uh, if you're like me, you've most likely tried learning something new, trying something different. You can probably see I tried picking up the guitar. I'm still very, very terrible at it. Um, I tried boxing, but uh, if you, there's nothing to punch, you, you really can't do much. And uh, I think I also tried uh, growing a beard. But four months down the line, and all I get is a goatee, man. This, it's, it's completely not fair. So um, a friend of mine said to do something interesting. A friend of mine decided to, do, to start baking. And baking is super fun. It's super interesting and it's very complex. It's a very precise thing. And I think, uh, and when I was thinking about it, I thought, hmm, I think I'll just call my session five ways to bake your remote cake. Because if you're baking, you're definitely, it's not in your house. The code is out there, your ingredients are out there and you want to put something together. And that reminded me of all the hustle and the pain that developers have been going through in these last few months, trying to deal with all that code not being around them. So uh, the official name of this session, of course, is how you can use VS Code for remote development. And let's jump into it. Let's, let's get right into it. So why should we develop remotely? Where, where did the inspiration come from? Um, we looked at different developers. We looked at developers in large organizations. So take an example of Facebook. Facebook has a massive repo. It's huge. You can't hold it on one computer. So if you have developers trying to reach out, commit their code, work with it, pull the code back in, it's very complex and you can't do that without a way of developing remotely. Let's take a look at the second scenario. We've worked with data scientists. And if you're a data scientist, you're most likely using 
a big powerful machine. You're most likely using virtual machines in the cloud and they may be GPU heavy, right? And you want to simply connect and get the code. And last but not least is we've seen a growth in cloud-based tools. You want to be able to go in, uh, edit your code quickly. And if it's a repo on GitHub, you don't want to pull the code. Maybe you're in a cyber cafe, maybe something broke and you're on a holiday, you don't have your PC, or maybe your PC crashed. All these things have happened. And we looked at that and a few things we saw. A, um, connecting to VMs and using tools like Vim uh, can be tricky. I, I, I have no beef with Vim. Uh, guys who use Vim on their, on their SSH terminals, you guys are awesome. I simply don't know how to exit. Uh, so I never use Vim. I'm terrified of Vim. Um, you can always, there's always a need to replicate context, right? If someone tells you, hey, this uh, this code is, let's say a Laravel example, this is a Laravel, uh, this is a Laravel uh, code base, this is a Node.js code base, and you don't have those tools, you don't know what do I need? Do I need to install Composer? Do I need uh, a tool to sandbox the environment? Um, People have then tried remote desktop, you know, where you connect to uh, a virtual machine remotely and you try and try, but let's be very honest, there's always going to be some lag. There's always going to be, it's going to be tricky, especially to set up in Linux and there can be, typing can be tricky, okay. And let's, and last but not least is of course, setting up development environments is hard work. It's tedious. You have to make sure you get the right versions. You have to make sure you're using the right space. And the good thing is tackling this has been done through containers. But if you're new to containers and you're not sure about how a Kubernetes cluster works, you're going to probably get lost. And for us internally at Microsoft, I think what came along was Windows subsystem for Linux, where we actually integrated Linux into Windows. And I'll talk a bit about that. Uh, and we learned it's, it was getting tricky for developers to develop within that space. And so we decided to try and tackle these issues. So originally, um, Visual Studio Code was this monolithic block where you had multi-process capabilities spread across the software. But when uh, the idea for remote development came along, it was just one simple decision. If VS Code can run remotely, and if VS Code is multiprocessor, why not split this apart, right? You have the UI and the theme and all the fancy stuff that you want to look at as a user run on your local operating system. And then you have a processor, or sorry, a set of processes that handle extensions. And what makes this really, really powerful is you can take these processes and instead of running them on your local PC, you can run them anywhere. You can run them in a container. You can run them on the cloud. You can run them in Windows subsystem for Linux. You can run this virtually anywhere. And with that simple change, that just one simple architectural change, the whole ecosystem can change. And we are going to take a look at some very interesting examples and some of the nifty things you can do when you have VS Code as a tool in your arsenal. As we've mentioned, extensions are where the magic happens. And so right now, if you hop into VS Code, you will see you have remote extensions, remote WSL, that's Windows Subsystem for Linux, remote SSH, that's for SSH clients, I'll show that. Remote containers allows you to engage with containers and do some very interesting things. And the remote development pack basically brings all these things together. But here's a really cool trick is extensions, and, and, and Omoji mentioned this, is that extensions don't just run on your PC or in your local environment. You can actually take the extensions you use and love to your remote environment, making sure that every time you connect, you don't have to set up consist constantly. It's very easy to get up and get running. So let's start with the fun stuff, right? Let's start with code spaces. And I'm pretty sure we've all heard about code spaces. It's been all over. And I'm pretty sure some of you are wondering, hey, what are code spaces? What can I do with code spaces? And so I'm just going to switch this down and uh, I'm going to share my screen, right? 
And I'm going to, let's open my GitHub profile for a second here. And if you take a look at uh, a few of my repositories, let's pick one fancy one. Let's say the cat said node. And now if I wanted to edit this, let's say I've just been given this project. I know it's a Node.js project just by looking around and figuring out what it is, but I don't have the resources locally to run this. So what can I do? I can simply come in here and say open with code spaces and I'm going to let that open. So what's happening right now? The code space is literally a container and your code is being put into that container. And if uh, you put in, you can A, you can customize your settings, by the way, so it's not set in stone. And B is you can actually run everything you need here. And you'll notice this UI looks very familiar. And I'm going to zoom in a bit. It's very familiar. This is a lot like VS Code. And the amazing thing is you can do virtually everything you usually do. And I'm going to zoom out to make this a bit legible. There we go. I can take a look at my code. I can come in here. I can edit it if I wanted to. I can add my comments. I can uh, do everything I virtually do. But what if I want to run this, right? What if I want to do some interesting things like, A, I want to engage with the terminal. I want to run some commands. Maybe I want to do an NPM start. And you'll see automatically it goes in and it starts my NPM instance. Why? Because this is a containerized space. But I can take that further and say, I want to link to this, uh, to this uh, web space and actually engage with it. So what can I do? I can forward my port. So since I know this is running on port 3000, all I need to do is approve that. And if I click on this, you'll notice I actually get a running instance of my project. We're not going to press the button just yet, but I just want to show you how easy it is to move from looking at a repository to going all the way to editing it and running it. And so if someone sends you some code and is like, hey, I can't figure out what's wrong here. You don't need to go in and set up 30 minutes. Oh, I need to pull in the right node version. I need to test. I need to pull your code. I need to compile, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's now so easy and so fast. And I'm barely scratching the surface of what's possible. You can actually do your debugging in this instance. You can actually go in and allow me to zoom out a bit here. You can actually go in and touch on our second point, do a live share. So everything I'm doing here is also doable on VS Code, which we'll be touching on in a sec. So what's a live share? Think of it as joint collaboration on code. The same way you can jointly edit a document anywhere online right now, you can also do the same with your code. Why not? It's literally the same process. So all I need to do as Lawrence is come in and say, join or a collaboration session if I'm joining a friend's session, or I can start a collaboration session. And so right now it's firing up the extension and I can decide to invite participants. So I don't have anybody out there waiting just yet, but if I decide to open this link, it launches VS Code and someone else anywhere in the world can come in and join me on, in, in the same code space. So I'm just going to put that on the left and put this on the right. And uh, this will take a second as it pulls in the code and I need to sign in. Um, I'll sign in with my official work account so that you can see the, the difference. There we go. Now we'll take a sec. Apologies for that. This is why you're always supposed to make sure you don't go into your demos live. And I'll say that that open and it's signing me in. Ta-da. Oof. Yeah. No, there we go. Um, I'll just cancel this and that. Good. Now, let's have these two side by side. If I notice I'm scrolling, oh, I've made one mistake. I am using the same user account. But you'll notice on the browser, A is it shows me 
which user is currently typing. And so wherever I am, and this could be a completely different person, I could go in, edit, put in code, and all this is possible live. Meaning if you're running into an issue, if you are experiencing something that you need to fix, it's so easy. You simply click a button, get your friend to come in and help you. And guess what? If I'm using code spaces, I don't even need to install VS Code. I can do this on the browser. And if that doesn't make my remote development easy, I don't know what will. So there is a lot more to code spaces um, that I won't touch on in this because we only have a very short period of time. But I hope that has whetted your appetite for some of the amazing things you can do with this platform. It's amazing and I am super excited to always use this stuff. And let's go into VS Code itself. Now, the next thing we'll touch on is Windows subsystem for Linux. I don't know how many of us have heard of it. I don't know how many of us have used it, but in case you're not familiar with Windows subsystem for Linux and how it can help you as a developer is if you have to use a Windows PC and maybe you're wondering, how do I set up Linux? It's as simple as jumping into the store and pulling Linux into your machine. So what does this help you do? So if you're a Linux developer like myself, you can easily hop into your terminal, and uh, I'm going to open the new Windows terminal, which is awesome, by the way. If you haven't used this, do give it a look. And it allows you to access it locally on your machine in a very easy and simple way. So, sorry, there we go. I'm going to open an Ubuntu instance. And to prove this is an Ubuntu instance, I've installed Kausi and Fortune, which is awesome. You will have good luck and overcome many hardships. That sounds very zen. Thank you. So. What can I do here? A, I am going to zoom in a bit. Let's go there. LSB release minus A. So as you can see, this is an actual full-blown Ubuntu instance that's running here. But within this Ubuntu instance, um, I can access my local file system and I can interact with it in the same way I would in Linux. So if I hop into my projects, I can see I have a very well named project called some project, right? And let's hop into some project. Okay. And if I want to open Visual Studio Code, it's simply code then full stop. And what this will do is it will remotely connect into the WSL instance and pull up my code. And notice now on Visual Studio Code, I have a nearly local experience, right? My terminal is running the bash terminal from WSL. My code, which is actually a Laravel project, uh, I'm pretty sure this will make Prosper really happy, um, is actually running here. So what are some of the nifty things I can do? A eh? is I can run this as if it were on Linux. So if I was to do a PHP artisan serve, which is how you run, oh, oh sorry, how you run your Laravel project, I can very easily set that up and it will, uh, let's give it a second and it will run and I should be able to access it in a few seconds. In case you're wondering, how do I access this from Visual Studio Code? Oh, there we go, it's already started. And I'm simply going to click there and ta-da. Windows subsystem for Linux does one sweet thing for you. It port forwards for you. So you'll notice my IP address here, the port is slightly different. And to prove this is the same project, I'll say there, hello, GitHub folks, uh, folks across Africa. Oof, and save that and come back to my browser and refresh and hello there, guys. Ta-da, simple. So if you have your code sitting on Windows subsystem for Linux, it's very easy to use and very easy to reach. But you might be thinking, hey, Lawrence, I, I honestly don't use Windows subsystem for Linux. I, I don't care much for it. I don't know how to use it. I have my code seated on a box somewhere. It's online. Okay, so let's go to a second scenario. Right? Let's say my work is seated on a box online. So over here, I have a uh, PHP or an Ubuntu box running PHP. And uh, it's currently seated on Azure. 
and I'd like to connect to it via SSH. So previously, what I'd have to do is open terminal, create my SSH connection, and then connect, and then use Vim or Nano to go in and edit the files. But how can Visual Studio Code make my life easier? So let's come down here. You'll see there's a tiny little blue box at the bottom, and it says open a remote window. And because I have my extensions installed, I can say connect to host. So how does it know the hosts? There's, there's no magic being done here. It's actually pulling from your SSH file. So my SSH file is not currently updated. I need to uh, change this IP um, and I'll put it in here and I'll paste that there, hit save, and now we can connect. So I'll connect to host, I'll connect to my Ubuntu on Azure box, and it's going to take a few seconds as it connects, authenticates, and then the next step will be to ask me, where do I want to go? So now it's connected, you'll see it down here. And what I can do is open the folders. So I'll click on open folder, and you'll notice it gives me my bar over there at the top. For anyone who's a Linux guy, you'll know it's always Ubuntu, it's var, www, and I'll open that. And you'll see I have two folders there. I'll work with both of them. I'll simply say, okay. And now I can open my entire editing area. So in a few clicks, I am now connected to the online virtual machine. I have my Laravel project here up and running. I have the default index.html page and I can interact with any of them. So let me give an example. So let's say, let's pick the index.html page. It's the default page, right? So what can I do? I can notice even my terminal is now using the VMs uh, the VM terminal. So it's very easy to connect, very easy to reach, and I can easily run this with PHP minus S, localhost, let me say 3001, right, or 3001. Okay, so what does this code do for those of you who are not familiar with PHP? This is literally creating a small host and it gives me an IP address that I can connect to. But you might be thinking, hey, Lawrence, isn't that localhost on the virtual machine? And the answer is yes, it is localhost on the virtual machine. But guess what you can do with VS Code? You can forward that port. So all I need to do, and you'll notice it has automatically detected it, is simply forward that port and open it in my browser. And boom, I have my default page. And so it's very easy to do that. Let's say I want to do the same for my, uh, for my Laravel project. So let's go back here and I'm going to cancel that. Let's go back one step, hop into Laravel and I want to do a PHP artisan serve, which is the default Laravel setup. And notice automatically VS Code has detected and forwarded the port. So if I wanted to mess around with my uh, VS Code instance, uh, sorry, with my virtual machine instance, change the Laravel code, uh, I can easily hop in here, come down to, I think it's really resources, views, come to my welcome.blade.php and say, hello from the SSH side. And we can save that, come into my browser, Refresh, since the port is forwarded, that's automatic. Now, imagine that SSH box could be seated at your workplace. It could be seated at a friend's house. It could be seated online on AWS, Azure, GCP. It doesn't really matter. The thing is, as long as you have access, VS Code can go in. You can work on the code and share it and work together on it. Woof, that's a lot, right? And we're barely getting started. <laughs> There's still a lot more to come. Um, let's go to our next one and I'll just pull this up here. Containers. If you have not used containers of late, oh my friends, you are missing out. There is a lot you can do with containers. You can create, so think of a container basically as a sandbox, right? You want a virtualization environment without virtualizing the hardware. In fact, a container, can be simply defined as a virtualized OS without the hardware. 
but I'm pretty sure most of you have heard of containers and you're most likely running a few containers uh, of your own. If you haven't, I'd really, really recommend it because it makes working with your code so much easier. And I'm about to show you how much easier it gets using VS Code. So let's say you have no idea how containers work and you've just been sent a project. Cool. So I'm going to hop into my demos folder over here and I'm going to open my project called the cat said node. So I'm not a node developer, right? I, I, I don't know much about Node.js, but I've just been given a project and someone tells me, hey, Lawrence, we'd like you to work on this code. Where do I begin? And this is where VS Code can help you. Guess what? You can hop right in here and say, reopen in a container. And what this does is it will go online and pull a container definition for you and run your code inside that container. Meaning I don't need to install Node.js or PHP instances or Debian or Ubuntu on my machine. If my code base, and I'm pretty sure like my code base, I know is a Node.js code base, I simply need to click a button, tell it to open in a certain kind of container and that's it. So if you've never done it before, for example, let's assume I've never written a line of Node.js code, um, which is not true apparently, um, I can simply click on that and get a predefined container configuration. So I'll say I want a Node.js instance. I even get to be asked the Node version I want. I want version 14. And what it does is it goes in, pulls the Docker configuration file, and I'm going to have to rebuild my box here, I'm just going to tell it to rebuild. I don't think that will be a problem. Hopefully my internet doesn't give up on me. And it actually, as you'll notice, creates the container live for you, boom. And it's done literally in seconds. And now, as you'll see from the terminal, I have a container waiting for me. And since I know what exactly is needed, I can say NPM start. And guess what? Just as in the other example, if I know the port that's being forwarded, and I'm just going to refresh this a bit, I can easily forward that port. I know my code is definitely spitting out at port 3000, and I can forward that to my local host 3000. And when I open that, I have my project. So let's just walk through that again. If you have a code base and you are not sure of the environment you need to run it in, you can literally create a container on the fly and run the project. And even better yet, you can install your extensions. You're not limited. You can come in here and install any extension you want. You can run your debugger. You can do all these things literally on the fly. So if, if you're seated remotely and wondering, oh my goodness, my computer can't run this, right? You have options. You can go online, run it there. If you are new to containers or you don't know the container definition, you can literally create one. So let's take a look at this file. This file is important. This file allows you to define the commands you want to run. So, and you'll see there are some very good examples in there. You'll see, for example, you can use a post create command to tell it, hey, after you finish creating the container, run yarn install for me. Um, you can go in and you'll notice you can, of course, edit the code. So if I was to come into my main.js, I can easily come in here. I can add whatever code I want, whatever comments I want to add in here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a fully blown live space. I can also run and debug if I wanted to. I can add my breakpoints. And all this is so easily done without literally creating or downloading a Docker definition and even figuring out what Docker is in the first place. So I think this is amazing. But, but ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't stop there. Let's say you already have an existing uh, set of containers. So I'm going to open a project here called PHP Docker, which is super descriptive. I love how I named these things. This is a project, right? It has a few Docker files. It has a Docker definition. This is for people who've already been using containers and I want to set this up. So straight from VS Code itself, I can get my containers up and running. 
it's done. Uh, I think those are already running before. There's an extension uh, over here, a Docker extension, and I know my containers. So I know my code is within this container, the Nginx container. I have a few options. I could try and you know connect to the container, but I want to edit my code. So what can I do? I can very quickly and easily attach VS Code to that container. And now I am now engaging with the container as if it were uh, local. Very simple. What have we done again? It's go in, right click on your container and simply attach VS Code to it. And now I can edit all the code I want to edit Oh, sorry, <laughs> that's been canceled. I can edit all the code I want to edit. I can engage with it. For example, it has already detected I have a tunnel. And if I open this in my browser, I'm able to uh, connect to the, to the, sorry, I need to zoom in here. I'm able to connect to that Nginx instance. And I can do this for virtually any kind of container. And so if you're talking or dealing with containers, VS Code can take you to literally the next level. And I mean, that's a lot of things we've touched on, right? Um, and these slides are going to be available and you can very easily uh, reach out and use them. VS Online is now code spaces and I believe I've touched on them. And I would really, really love for you to go in, try this stuff, build the code, use VS Code. The extensions are ready. You literally simply have to come to VS Code, click extensions and open them literally right there and mess around with it try it it's so much fun it's so easy you can collaborate with friends you can use containers ssh windows subsystem for linux if this isn't the future of engaging with code in a new and amazing way i don't know what is i'll stop there um, I hope you've learned a lot. I hope you've enjoyed the session. And um, if you want to reach or get the resources, uh, and I forgot to mention that, uh, please feel free to go to aka.ms stroke GHA, that's GitHub Africa VS Code. And you'll get these slides, you'll get the links that you can go to, and you can also go in and mess around and figure out what you can do there. So. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. I know it's been a lot of information. And as always, stay awesome, guys. I'll see you guys on the code side. Over to you, Omoju. I love that. See you on the code side. Next up is going to be Samson Gadi. He's going to be telling us about why you should care about open source. Samson, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Awesome, awesome. So I, I believe you might have learned about like a lot of things today because literally everything I've been hearing so far is open source. I just feel like I just need to pack my bags and go because the speakers have been amazing from Prosper to Lawrence, which is you know really awesome. But today I'll be focusing, you know, particularly in the terminology of what open source is, might be a little bit tricky because I'm not referring to like open source software, but you'll be hearing me talking about more of like community because this is something that I'm very passionate about. So I would share my slides right now. Just give me a minute. Uh, very horrible with slides. <laughs> OK, awesome. So this is a very interesting conversation because I kind of like coined it to be like power for the people because you know, you've been hearing a lot of things so far. And I feel like you know, this is like the opportunity for you to see how amazing you could get this tool and also contribute to all these platforms. Because one of the cool things about open source is about getting you know contributors and people that uses the tool basically around the community. Um, so um, a little bit about me: I am the co-founder for the Open Source Community Africa, um, the, the 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 organization responsible for the Open Source Festival, which was really awesome. The last big thing before the COVID, <laughs> and um, currently I'm serving as a board member for Open Source Collective, which is a again a, a, an organization that that is responsible for helping to sustain open source projects. And currently I've been serving for, as a board of director for a project that I've been involved for the past 11 years now, um, called Sugar Labs. And I, sometimes I kind of call myself uh, a commissioner for open source, which is, which is kind of funny. But then 
obviously, I, I believe Prosper would, 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 would attend to this. I'm like a self-anointed jollof rice advocate. Please don't ask me which country jollof is the best. I won't comment, but I know that jollof rice is the best. <laughs> yeah, so let's, let's jump into it. So open source, um, I, I, I believe majority of you here, um, you know, listening to me might be, you know, a bit confused of what open source is. But the way I see it is a bit interesting because the way you can look at the screen is saying that open source can be read, modified, and then shared by others because of its design and code is publicly accessible. And another way about open source is, particularly in the community side, again, like I said, I'll be talking more about the community, is the fact that contributing to open source can be a rewarding way for you to learn because you know, starting your career as a software engineer or starting your career as a designer or as a technical writer or just basically doing stuff around technology is kind of very interesting because you sometimes always get this strange feeling that you want to have a mentor or somebody to give you like a you know, real life working experience. But then open source is that ecosystem, like a marketplace where you get to have the opportunity to learn, to teach, to build experience in just about any kind of skill set that you can imagine. You know, it's not, just, it's not just about, you know, writing code, but the fact that anything you could do that could improve that project is just basically contributions. So this is a, a definition from the open source guide, which is, I think, is self-hosted on GitHub. So you can go to open source guide. You can learn much about open source, even more than what I'm going to be saying today. So like I said, community is very important in open source because these are people that work night and day remotely. You know, currently I, I work in a project where I am I'm one of the core maintainer and I'm currently in Port Harcourt, Nigeria, talking to you right now. And we are distributed globally in different time zones. And the fact that, again, this photo was the last uh, group event that I went to. This is the Open Source Festival in Lagos, Nigeria, February. Um, I believe February 20th to 22nd. They were really awesome people because these are people that came together you know, to, to, to learn about open source, to share about what they've been doing in open source from different things in from you know, engineering to design to technical writing, in, including you know, looking for ways to like, guide people into the community, which is really awesome. Um, and one of the things that uh, the, our folks in the open source community Africa we like saying is the fact that the future is open. Uh, I know this is very vague, but this is a, a, a terminology that our, uh, my team at the Open Source Community Africa said, hey, what about we just say the future is open? Because everybody right now is trying to do something around open source. It's kind of like the de facto of, of, of being into you know, um, technology, because literally at some stage, you see yourself using you know, open source. And thanks to platform like GitHub, and, and you see a lot of you know, opportunities that you can use to leverage your skill set. But now, um, the, 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 the aim of the stock is about why should you care about open source? Why should you be listening to me telling you about open source? Why not go and do something different? The reason is because open source kind of answers all the question in some way. I, I, I like saying, um, um, to give an example, I, um, I was this kid that was curious that um, I was about eight, eight years old when I got my first Linux machine. And I was using the machine, and for some reason, I got stuck. And I was looking for the community behind the project. And I was like, and, and when I was going through the code, I saw the, 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 the website of the community. So I easily jumped on on GitHub. And then I saw that, oh, there was a huge community of people that are building this, this, this software called Sugar. It's a, it's a Linux desktop um, for, for children. Again, I was eight, obviously. I'm a kid. <laughs> so it was really interesting for me because I had that opportunity to be part of the community, and I saw myself um, growing in the technology aspect. And so also to have this whole diverse skill set to understand how community works. Because again, on my slide, you see the fact that with open source, that's the way you can build your way up. Now you might say, how do I build my way up? Like, what, what is the thing that I could do? Or what are the things that I could gain by just be part of open source? Like you can see, you can make a great impact. Impact is one of the things that you, you, you see a lot because your small contributions can be a huge difference for, for one user somewhere. It could also be a, a point for your career growth. It could even make you a much better person. I remember when I was much younger, I couldn't talk really well with people, but today, I'm giving, I'm, I'm, I'm presenting here live, just giving me, making, 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 giving the idea that, hey, you know, you can also have great people skills, which is really awesome. And I've been working remotely for the past 10 years, which is really crazy because the fact is open source is actually online. 
And the fact is, you could you could start having that culture of having the working remote experience, which is like the, the, the theme these days, because again, text to COVID, everybody's working remotely. And the fact that people are looking for the best tools, you know, the best place to be. But with open source, you're kind of prepared for, for things like this or in, in situations like this. And then the most important one is paid opportunities. There are many ways you could gain from open source, from outreach programs to you know, working on open source full time, or just basically doing stuff you know, that, that encourages you to do things. They are really amazing stuff. And I'll be, talk, and I'll be um, emphasizing more on this later on the slide. Um, during the festival, a friend of mine made the statement. This is really interesting. So I just kind of like open source this talk. I hope he's not going <laughs> to find me. Uh, he said something. He said, nobody did it because everyone thought somebody would do it. Somebody would do what anybody could have done. This is quite interesting because when people keep asking me, Samson, what do I do in open source? Like, how do I jump into a contribution? Uh, how do I get my first open source contribution? I always tell them, look for ways, just try to be you. Try to do something that relates to you. You know, because the fact is, if you keep thinking that if you get stuck somewhere, let's say you're working on a code and it gets stuck somewhere, and you know how to fix that issue and just say, hey, let me just wait for the maintainer to figure it out. There's high chances that that maintainer might just skip it. And then your life might be a little bit miserable. But the fact is, if you can go back to the community and say, hey, I was doing something this way, and then I figured out this way was going to be much easier, and I felt like this is going to help you know, more um, contributors in, in the future, that basically you helping to collaborate and to, for you to make your first open source contribution, because this is something that open source is basically all about. And, and speaking about open source um, um, journey, um, like I said, I, 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 growing up, um, I started my open source contributions when I was in grade, um, in, in Nigeria, we call it JSS1. I believe that is grade seven. And I was working on a, on a platform. Um, it was a game that was, I was playing online. It was based on Flash, heavily then. I saw that over a thousand students in my school was basically spending a lot of money on the internet trying to play this game online because again, it's a Flash-based game. I was like, okay, what do I do? So I created a game based on GTK. Um, if you're big in the Linux part of it, the, the Gnome Toolkit, I built the, this game. Um, it's called, um, well, on, on the Sugar platform called um, Football, as you can see on the repo. Because I, I joined GitHub platform around 2013, which is about, I can't remember, like, very, like seven, seven years ago, which is really awesome. So when I built this locally in my school, I was able to share this code using a flash drive. And I noticed that it, People in my school was loving the, 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 the way everything was going. But the fact is people wanted to do more. And then I felt like, what if I tried to move this, you know, the project I was working on locally and look for ways that I could share it with the global community, the Chica Labs community. And then I reached out to Walter. If you, if you look at here, um, I, I spoke with Walter, which is the founder of the, of the project. I was like, hey, I have this cool solution that I think will be awesome. And then I hosted it on GitHub. Um, I believe, uh, I can't remember the year exactly, but I pushed it on GitHub. And then we both collaborated to make, it, to make sure that the, the code was you know, better for the App Store because the, 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 environment, the desktop environment was based on the App Store, just like your Play Store or your Apple Store or your Windows Store, or just basically a store that you can get apps. And when, I, when, I, when, we, when we make this public, under a month, I got over 36,000 downloads. I'm talking about over 36,000 downloads that is not mobile related. It was awesome. I started getting awesome feedback from you know, Hong Kong, South America, and also in, in the US, which was really awesome for me because I was like, hey, so this is a big deal. Like, this is something that I thought that I, I built a solution for my school and I tried to make it global. And then everybody was just liking the experience. Now, imagine I didn't take that attempt. How would people get to experience the amazing stuff that I built? Maybe it might, might not really be amazing, but to me, it was really awesome. And again, I got the good feedback because of the, 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 the number of engagements. And now I know you'll be asking yourself, okay, I don't code. I'm not, I, I might not be a, 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 great, a great developer's evangelist like Prosper, or I might not have the opportunity to be the community or might not be a, 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 a technologist in, in some way, but what can I do? On this slide, there are numerous of ways you could do things, but the most important thing that I try to do here is to make sure that I, I highlighted the creator role. If you go to an open source project and you, kind, you, you want to contribute to it and you find it very difficult for you to be part of that project, try suggesting something to the community. Because the, the, one of the interesting part about open source is nobody have it, like there's no project that will tell you that, hey, we don't want anybody. 
I know how many times that I've been in project that I've said, hey, I don't want to do this, but I, I feel like doing this, these things this way will make it much better. They'll work with you, they'll make sure that you'll feel welcome. And that's the whole point about the community. So you don't necessarily need to be a designer or a developer or a researcher, or a technical writer, yeah, and so forth, as I mentioned on the slide, you can also create a role. And basically to get started, I just like what I've been mentioning, I'm just trying to do more of a recap. The first is find an open source project to contribute to. There are numerous ways you can do this. Join a community. There's a lot of communities right now. The, the one in right now in Africa is called the Open Source Community Africa. There's four loop. There's numerous of communities that you can join. And there's one thing I always like saying a lot every time on Twitter, if you follow me on Twitter, I like saying, make a meaningful contribution. So try as much as you can to place um, quality over quantity. So it's not about the numbers of peer requests you push, but the amount of quality work that you give. And then you collaborate, you learn, and you grow. And then the last one I always like saying every time I'm talking about open source is to go forth and prosper. And I'm, yeah, obviously prosper is here, but to go forth and prosper because this is the way that you build your way up. You become that 10X or whatever you want to call yourself where you can self-proclaim evangelist like myself. Because that's one of the things that you could do. And then there's numerous ways you can join on open source um, and, and to get paid opportunities and also to join into open source. There's the Google Summer of Code, which is a, a paid um, um, approach for you to come into open source. There's Outreach, there's Season of Docs if you're huge into technical writing. There's, there's, there's GitHub. If, if you're looking for a project I want to jump on, you could go and use some of the awesome GitHub tools like the github.com slash explorer, or you could go to you know, firstcontributions.github.io. You can go to github.com slash collections. You could do up for grab. You could also look for great documentation like the open source of guide, 24 pull requests. There are really awesome ways you could do it. Or if you're stuck, you could still come on Twitter and then try to ask the community. Because again, one of the awesome things about Twitter is that you could come and ask questions and people are always welcome to have you because again, it's part of the community. So I will end up by saying you should go back. This, is, this has been an awesome event. I'm really, awesome. I'm, I'm really excited to make sure that I'm really excited that I'm, I'm here talking to you today. But the fact is you need to go back and look for ways to give back to the community. If you're using an open source tool, you need to start thinking on ways that you could get give back to the community. It could be your code, it could be donations, it could be awesome. There's, there's also platforms like GitHub Sponsor, like that's the great way for you to you know, give back to people that you, that you rely on in the community side, because that's the whole point about being a community, by making sure you have an awesome network of people that are working night and day to make your life better, and making sure that you give that contributions, whether it's respective of your, of your career, or your technical skills, or just asking questions. So thank you very much, everybody. You can always follow me on Twitter at Samson Gaudi underscore, I'm Samson underscore Gaudi. Um, this slide was really great. I kind of like fucked it from Abigail. Yeah, she, she's really awesome. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody. Have a nice day. Thank you, Samson. So next up, um, I think you can stop sharing your screen now, Samson. Yeah, so you're doing that right now. Okay, awesome. Perfect. And next up after Samson, we're gonna have Corvus. He's gonna be telling, talking to us about GitHub Actions using Terraform to provision infrastructure. Corvus, you're on. Cool, awesome. Let me quickly share my screen. Uh, we'll share that one. Go. Bring it up. That button, sorry, give me a sec here. I'm not used to presenting on Windows. Let's just see, oh, the wrong way around. And we should be good to go. Um, can anybody just quickly confirm that my screen is showing? Cool, I'm going to go. Is that a yes? Okay, cool, awesome. Uh, welcome everyone and thank you for having me. Um, I'm gonna be talking about Terraform and GitHub Actions today. Uh, just quickly a step back in terms of where I come from, uh, so I'm a developer advocate at AWS, uh, developer for about 15 years before I joined and I was an AWS customer for eight years of those, but more importantly, I use Terraform since version 0 0.6, so that's probably about five to six years now in total that I've been using it. Uh, what you can see at the bottom right is my actual roof, but unfortunately, as you can see on the left there, Google Maps does not yet show it properly. Um, I was hoping for a more higher def image, but not, not yet. And then for those not uh, aware, I am based in Cape Town, which is where we launched a recent uh, a region recently. Um, so today's agenda. 
uh, bit of background first is that I started off with a whole bunch of slides and then I realized that we are doing a meetup. So I decided let us draw the ditch all the slides and go for um, code. And I recorded that code because my mouse is broken and I've got an old one here and the scroll wheel is broken. So even the videos will have up and down scrolling. So apologies for that for now. Um, just quickly want to comment on Lawrence's um, lifestyle that he enjoyed at the moment where he was uh, able to pick up boxing and he was able to pick up a uh, guitar. Um, I would love to do that, but I'm on the other side of the fence. For those with you who do have kids, I feel for you. It has not been fun. So yes, a lot of fun there. Um, also my beard, this is my lockdown. No, joking. This beard has been here for a while. Cool. So what are we going to do today? Um, we are going to start off with a very basic demo. I'm just going to show you how we spin up a single instance using GitHub Actions and Terraform. And it's actually going to be using Terraform Cloud in the background to do that for us. So what we are going to uh, then jump into is quickly to just touch on what infrastructure is code, because not everybody is always familiar with that term. Um, and then quickly going to talk about why we want to use multiple accounts to separate our resources. And then it becomes the whole discussion around how do we actually jump between these different accounts and use it. And that involves account switching and role switching. And then we are going to go ahead and go into a slightly more advanced demo where I'll show you what my findings were with uh, Terraform Cloud and GitHub Actions and how we do that. Um, and then I believe there's Q&A at the end. So hopefully we will have a couple of questions there. So let's quickly get started directly with a demo. So, uh, sorry, my slides are gone. Uh, the wrong way around. Give me a second here. Okay, let me just skip through this. Dick now has decided to no, no, no. Okay, I will come back to this. Don't worry. There we go. Sorry about that. Cool. So let us see if this actually plays. Like I said, it's been a fun day. So what we have in front of us is basic Terraform. You can copy this off the example page. It's pretty much exactly what it is. I look up a, uh, an AMI for Ubuntu. And then what I do is I spin up a very simple EC2 web instance, which is a, um, a virtual machine. So I use this. And then what I need to do to be able to um, get this Terraform to run is I need to set up a workspace inside my Terraform cloud. Um, now I've named that um, GitHub. Um, I'll see if we have GitHub Africa Meetup. And over here, you can see that it's actually been running already. And here you can see the current run and the run list and all the details of the infrastructure that I'm going to be creating with this. So that's the easy part. And then where the fun comes in is where you define to make it run. And this is where you make use of, and sorry, this is where my mouse is starting to give me issues. Um, and sorry, this is a bit of background noise. Um, and what you can see over there is that I've defined it to actually run it on all branches. And um, what you can see over here is that I'm defining jobs. The first one sets up the actual Terraform workspace because you need a Terraform binary to be able to um, run it. So then I'd run Terraform format to make sure the code is correct. And then Terraform initialize. And this installs all the uh, requirements in your project. And then we finally go over the, the section where we do Terraform plan. Um, and sorry, is it possible just to mute the background for me? It's very confusing. Um, in any case, so we do the plan, we do it on pull requests, et cetera. And then ultimately we do the uh, output to the actual PR. And this is where it becomes um, a little bit more interesting because when we change our infrastructure, we actually want to be able to review it like we do other code. This is the whole point behind the whole setting that it's infrastructure as code. We commit our code, we PR our code, we review our code, and we know what it's going to do. We run some tests, et cetera. Then there's also a couple of safety checks in here just to make sure that the plan outcome actually was successful. And then finally, what happens is that we only run the Terraform apply on the actual um, one where on the main branch. And there you can see over there in line 62. So what I did over here is that I'm quickly just going to add a little bit of text to force a um, bolt. So we are adding that and now we're going to go just commit it and then push it up. Um, and this will ultimately kick off our GitHub action. So the nice part here is that you don't have to set up anything between your actual uh, version control system and your build system to actually kick this off because it's hosted, it, it's GitHub, it's all the same thing. Um, so we are just going to quickly uh, commit and sorry, I'm typing very slowly here and push it and then we will see that build kick off. Now what this does in the background is that GitHub knows how to communicate with Terraform Cloud by an API key that I've set up. So GitHub itself doesn't actually run the Terraform uh, plan and apply. It actually remotes, executes it on cloud to do that for that uh, for us. And Terraform Cloud um, on the other side has got the AWS credentials configured to be interacting with my AWS account. Now, what we're going to be seeing a little bit later when we get to the multi-account setup is that there's only one set of credentials configured. 
And what we can see over here is that our Terraform uh, build pipeline is now kicking off. So you can see there where it goes through the different jobs. You can open them up to actually see all the details. Um, here is where we are initializing. So that inner step actually installs plugins, it installs uh, any of the providers that you need, et cetera, and also initializes the backend, which is the one that I showed you in that file to communicate with Terraform Cloud. Um, now what it's doing is now doing the actual plan stage. Now, how Terraform does planning is by, it says, I've got a file where I define what infrastructure you want. I kept state of what was running last time and I can query the, um, the provider, which AWS is just one of, that can actually um, check what the difference is. And then it goes like, this is what I want to apply, which is what we see on screen here. Now, it's very nice that it displays it here inside this um, build job, um, but that's not that useful. And also we can see that it didn't do the actual apply steps, which is great because this is still a PR. We don't want to make changes. So when I go to the actual PR page, um, we can see there that the, uh, it commented on my code, uh, on my PR. And when I expand that little node over there, the, the show plan, and this is all configurable inside that uh, build job, we can actually see that it wants to create an AWS web instance for us with all of the various um, configuration options available on it. And now what we need to do is if we want to actually roll out this infrastructure, we need to actually merge it to um, our main branch. And over here, you can see I'm being a bad developer by um, applying my admin rights. Uh, what you want to do is you want to definitely protect your branch uh, your uh, main branch that you deploy from because you don't want to just randomly run the infrastructure. So always make sure that someone else at least verifies, so thumbs up at least once and also that the test pass because that way you know it can actually be safe. So now what's happening is now we get to the fun part where we are actually starting to create some infrastructure and we do this without touching our cloud providers um, console or API or anything. Terraform will do it for us. What you can see over here is that it's busy running the apply. And now the first part here is, I'm going to refresh this a few times, um, is that Terraform Cloud doesn't yet have the ability to output a plan, which is a plan file that you can see exactly what it wants to apply. And then you can say, take this file and go and apply it. Um, that seems to be a future, um, feature that's coming. That's one of the things that I picked up that was a little bit interesting, because normally what you would do is you would run a plan, see the um, what it wants to do. And then when you actually merge, you know that that's the actual plan that it'll apply. So it didn't uh, accidentally something else um, or something changed in the meanwhile, and then it tries to reapply that type thing. Um, so that's normally how I do my workflows, but I can kind of see somewhat what their plan is over here. And over here, we can see we are still in the process of actually applying. Um, this does take a few seconds. So let me grab a um, sip of water here. This just feels long because I'm um, sitting up here and there we go, boom. We can see that we've got our new instance there. infrastructure using a GitHub pipeline action and without having to touch any of our infrastructure providers. So now let's quickly get into a little bit of uh, terminology. Sorry, now I need to jump back to where I was, which is over here. So there we go. Sorry, this is not me last minute dragging and dropping. So question around what is infrastructure as code? Well, a little bit of background first. Um, if you've been to a previous talk you might have, um, of mine, you might have seen this before, um, but the tooling that we had available a few years back was uh, using imperative languages, we called it. These were tools where you had like sequential steps, step A, step B, step C, step D. And if the starting point wasn't exactly where you expected it, things would break. The reason is that you would, like, for example, create a directory, copy a file from somewhere else. Now, if that file wasn't in the location you specified, things would break. Um, and that was a good start, but over time it becomes very, very brittle and it becomes very difficult to keep your infrastructure up to date. So what changed um, since then is that a lot of the tooling on um, now I use declarative language. Um, and you'll see Terraform does this as well, which is I tell you what I need. I want a load balancer. I want five web servers. I want a database with 30 gigs of space, et cetera, et cetera. I don't tell you what, uh, how to go create it. I just tell you what I want. And then the tooling figures out what's the difference between what you want and what the current state is and figures out the delta and then goes and applies the delta. And you'll see a lot of the actual um, uh, tooling now does that um, purely from a, a perspective that it's easy and it doesn't cause as many headaches when the steps aren't in order. So quickly, goals for infrastructure as code. Well, the first one is that we want to make infrastructure changes repeatable and predictable. And the reason for this is that we've probably all been in that situation where you set up a dev environment, you get everything up and running perfectly, and you start deploying features to it, and things are looking good. And then all of a sudden, they decide on a Friday that, listen, we must get this to production. We're now ready. We must move get all of these new things in production today because it's it's important, right? And then you go ahead and rush and you go click around and run scripts and you basically hope that everything is set up the right way. And if it's not, you spend countless hours clicking through things and trying to fix that. So first thing is that you wanna make infrastructure changes repeatable and predictable. 
So by scripting all of your um, infrastructure changes, you apply it to dev, and exactly the same thing is applied to production. So there's no difference in terms of how you apply it. Um, speaking of the same, you also want to release your infrastructures the same way as your code. Now, this is where GitHub Actions was, um, is awesome, is that it literally is the same pipeline used for your normal code to do the build and test steps as part of your pull request. You can now add your infrastructure to it, and it runs the same um, kind of steps through it. You get some people to review it, and you actually then merge it back into your main branch and then release it. Um, so that is a big, big benefit. And then lastly, you can actually replicate your production environment um, to your dev and staging environment. And where this becomes interesting is we've also been all in that situation where you've got production, you've got development, and they are kind of the same, slightly the same, subtle differences, notes written down on a notepad you share with every new dev, dev that comes in. Um, this is, oh, by the way, when you use infrastructure as code correctly, it means that you can actually deploy the same code to dev as production. It doesn't mean that um, sorry, infrastructure. It doesn't mean that the, the infrastructure counts are the same. You might have 50 production web servers where you only have two in uh, development, etc. So where does that leave us? Let us quickly now jump to the rest of it. Let's just get past this quick. Uh, sorry, let me go. There we go. So this brings us to that next question, which is um, when we're going to start building up a lot of infrastructure, uh, we can start using multiple accounts for this. And the first question is, why do we want to use multiple accounts? Well, for those that are familiar with it, um, there's some good reasons, but let me quickly take you through an example that I used earlier this year at Ashi uh, Talks Africa. So firstly, let's say security in an account. You've got four different S3 buckets that you use for all your different um, environments. So you've got one for dev, testing, UAT, and production. Now what you start doing is you start creating a policy for bucket one, a policy for bucket two, policy for bucket three. And what you can see over here is that uh, this third one is only uh, getting and listing objects. It's no longer like the previous ones where you can just do anything to the bucket. And then lastly, you have a policy that denies any access on these production, uh, buckets for production. But now you've got four different sets of security policies in the same account that you now have to figure out which users got which access to one of these. And uh, you always have to make sure that you've got the right group set up. And it's sometimes get confusing, especially when you've got a lot of resources. Because then let's say your policy becomes a lot more complex because the user might have access to some of the dev stuff, some of the tests, not, not all of the UAT. Instead of doing that, start splitting it into multiple accounts because this way what you'll have is that there's a single policy in each of these accounts and you can call it um, the same like developer act developer s3 access now the policy name is the same but the actual policy itself is different be in between the different accounts and also the individual buckets live in the same accounts which means that if a dev is currently interacting with a dev account there's no way he can accidentally touch the testing account um, because that's not the account it's currently acting with. Similar with UAT and production. And once again, we've got those different um, sets of um, permissions there. And you can see in the prod one that we explicitly deny it. Another big benefit of this is that you can set up a main account. Um, sorry, there we go. Windows not playing along. And you use this main account to host your generic um, or common services. So things like your build jobs, your container registries, um, your DNS, et cetera, all of those things, because any um, when you start building up large systems, there's a subset of things that are common across all accounts. Then you've got things common to specific accounts. If it, let's say a load balancer. Each one of your development UAT and production accounts might have a single load balancer that all the services share. So you've got these different things and breaking them into smaller and smaller repositories and then being able to roll them out and separate them this way actually is a lot cleaner. It's a lot easier to keep track of what it is that you are busy building and working with. So now, this has been fun, and that initial demo was very nice and light, but let's go into a slightly more fun demo. And this is where I started really kicking the tires, as they say, with uh, GitHub Actions. It's like, how do I do this multi-account setup? Or locally, um, there's a nice make file. I'll share the GitHub repo um, at the end of the talk with you um, if you want to go look at it. But basically what it is, it's, uh, it said is like, how do I go about deploying to multiple accounts? So there were a couple of changes I had to make. Um, Cool, let me just check here. Um, I'm assuming I'm still live and that was is it practicing or something. Cool. Cool, what we have over here is that we are changing the production, um, the backend to be able to point to the dev and to the prod workspaces now. And we'll touch on the workspace later, but you can see here inside the Terraform cloud that I've got two different workspaces set up now, one for dev and one for prod. So what we have is, um, environment variables also for these. So they're not environment variables as in system level environment, they're per environment that we're dealing with. Things like, for example, the count ID, as well as some of the IP ranges, as well as the region that we are dealing with and the name. 
So now that I've got these files set up, we have to somehow inject them into our build pipeline to be able to do this hopping between the different accounts. And to do that, what we do is, um, you'll see as I've added some new steps to my uh, build pipeline now, where what I do is I copy that backend into the root folder because Terraform will look at any .tf file inside the same folder automatically. And I just call it backend um, for now. You could literally keep the same name if you want, but this will just make sure that I can overwrite it every time. And then what we have is, and what we have here is um, uh, the uh, Terraform variables. And what we will have now is the actual, uh, apologies, I just need to quickly mute. There we go. Sorry. And now what we're going to do is we are going to merge it in and we are going to kick off our setup. So, so, and what we can see over here is that we are busy um, creating all the infrastructure, which is a couple of IAM policies, an entire VPC. Um, so this is production ready VPC. So it's got public subnets, private subnets, et cetera. Um, and what we have over here is we're doing the same uh, bad developer experience and, oh, sorry, developer um, uh, thing where we do the merge, force merge. And now what we're doing is we are going to the actions and what is happening is that it is now kicking off that merge. Um, and now it's running from our main branch again. So now we're creating quite a substantial new amount of infrastructure. So firstly, what we'll see is that it'll actually delete uh, some of the, um, uh, sorry, it'll actually delete that in instance that we spun up. And then what it'll do is it'll go and create the uh, VPC for us. So let me quickly just double check here. It is busy running. And now what we can see is now it's going to do the apply stage. So now what I'll do is we're just going to, while this is running, is I will jump between uh, this and the actual console to just to make sure that we have all of the. Now this does take a few seconds to run. You can see all the different values over here. So we can grab a sip of water quickly. And we see, there we can see is that it's busy running. And there was a wait there. You can, when you run apply, you normally have to confirm and you can do that manually inside Terraform Cloud, or you can use a flag that actually does it for you. So what I'm doing now is um, I'm inside the primary account. And now what I'm going to show you is how we can easily jump to that development account. Now, remember when I said this is completely separate, it's like an entirely different account in AWS. So there's no way for this one to speak to the other one. And what we can see over here is that we have got our infrastructure starting to spin up already. So even if you want to go something uh, slightly more complex and run your infrastructure across the multiple different accounts, there are ways that you can use GitHub Actions to actually still keep this fairly simple for you. Now, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be expanding this um, at one point. Oh, and here you can see the actual bucket. So you can see there's the bucket that I just created. Um, and that was literally about an hour and a half ago that I did that. Um, and the what I'm going to be doing in some of the future demos is to put in conditional branches there so that, uh, or checks inside my uh, GitHub Actions. So that it first does dev, roll out the, um, the changes to the infrastructure, then it does the next environment um, sequentially. The reason for this is that you want to make sure that your changes actually work. You don't want to see that, hey, it broke on dev, and then you go like, but why did I roll, it, roll this out on production? Similar to how you would, for example, roll out new uh, code. If you roll it out on development and it broke, why are you rolling it out on production? You know it broke. So we're gonna, uh, I'm going to be building that in there. Um, that is it for the demo portion of the infrastructure that I wanted to show you that I create. So I just want to quickly sum it up with a couple of things that I, what did I find in terms of with playing with GitHub Actions and learning. Uh, the first part is that it's really, really easy to get started. Um, I, uh, I found it like super easy. It's one of the nicest tutorials that I followed. Um, and it's really step-by-step -step easy nowadays. It's, um, I've been coding for quite a long while and this is really one of the easiest way. Um, also, the ne second point that you get your feedback directly where your code lives. The fact that it is a couple of lines of code to add PR comments. Now, I just added the output from Terraform, but you can get quite creative there because remember, you've got uh, scripting and, uh, languages available to you. So you can actually drop down into, I believe, Python and a couple of other languages and do some very complex things should you want to. So your PR really becomes the, the hub of everything that happens. And you can see your infrastructure changes that you want to roll out there in one place. Um, and like I said, the PR integration really, really is awesome. Um, love that. Uh, one thing that I did find a little bit weird is that workspaces in Terraform Cloud are different from workspaces in Terraform with the CLI tool. And it took me a little bit of time to get my head around that. Um, I'm going to be spending some more time just to figure that out and uh, just make sure that I fully understand that because it does feel like I might be missing something at this point. Um, if you do multi-account, there might be a better way of doing it. This was just my first attempt at saying, hey, let's go multi-account and let's see how GitHub Actions and Terraform Cloud works with it. 
And with that, I want to say uh, thank you very much. Um, this was a lot of fun for me. Uh, you can see my contact details on the screen if you want to ping me afterwards with any questions and all that. Um, I just want to throw up my 8-bit um, If you do want to get hold of me, the easiest way is just head over to my GitHub page. You can pretty much find anything you want about me over there. And also very more uh, importantly, you can see there the first pinned project is actually the GitHub Meetup Africa demo. So all of the code that you saw here today and how it runs, even the PR of, um, branches along with some very sarcastic uh, commit messages are available there and you can go play with it right now should you want to. So with that, thank you very, very much. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you so much, Corvus. Thank you so much. And so we've come to the end of our meetup today. But before I leave, I want to share something with all of you, our attendees. So permit me just a second to share my screen. And here we go. So thank you, everyone. And before you leave, we want you to help take the survey so that we can know how we're gonna improve. And if we're serving you correctly, please take the survey. Afterwards, we're going to have breakout rooms so you can hang out and talk more with people. And so I thank you so much for staying with us. I saw a lot of you on YouTube. I know this has been extremely informative for me and I hope you've gotten a lot of this out of it as well. Thank you, see you all later, bye-bye. Don't forget, please take the survey.